Okay, welcome back. Welcome to April. First day of April. Happy April Fool's Day. Hopefully you'll play a trick on someone today. Hopefully that person is not me. Um, so today we're going to keep talking about recursion. This is our last lecture focused entirely on helping you wrap your mind around this powerful and yet somewhat slippery idea. So we're gonna do, go do a couple of practice problems together. Um, we're also going to talk about other types of situations in which we can use recursion. This week, the homework is focusing on recursion on trees. So you're gonna do five more tree recursion problems. One today, one tomorrow. They get gradually more interesting as the week goes on. But there are other contexts in which we can use recursion, and this week in lab, um, and in lecture, we're gonna to start to look at other places where we can apply the same problem-solving technique of taking a large problem and breaking it down into smaller pieces. Okay, so, welcome back. Hope you guys had a good weekend. Um, so let's talk about, let's do another problem together. So let's just get right into it. Let's imagine that we have a tree in the setup in the way that we're used to, um, and we want to print the value of the leaf nodes. This is also a good chance for us to review some of our terminology. A leaf node in the tree is a tree that has, is a node that has no children. When we recurse on trees, frequently we're gonna stop when we get to the leaf node. That's the, the farthest we can go. All right, so how do we approach this problem? So there were three steps that we wanna take when we design our recursive algorithms. Again, now an implementation, we'll get to that in a minute, but let's talk first about the algorithm for solving this problem. So first, what's our base case? Remember, when we make the problem smaller, we always want to identify the smallest the problem can be, at which point we can't break it down any further. Yeah. Yeah, we get to a leaf node. So once we've reached a leaf node, we're at the bottom of the tree. We can't make the problem any smaller. So once we get to a node with no children, our canonical technique for making trees into smaller problems that we can then solve using recursion is to take a tree, a node, and look at its subtrees. Each one of its subtrees is smaller than the entire tree, and so the problem is getting smaller, but once we get down to a leaf node, we've reached a node that has no children. And so there's no subtrees. There's no more smaller problems. We have to, have to start solving things. Now, because of the setup of the problem, what we want to do when we get to a leaf is actually print it. So we're going to print the value of the leaf node. Okay? How do we make the problem smaller? So this is sometimes known as the recursive step. Either I'm going to solve the problem when I get to the base case, or start solving the problem, or contribute a portion of the solution to the problem, or I have to make it smaller. So how do I make a tree recursion problem smaller? What's our canonical way of doing it? in common to pretty much every problem that we do on trees. Make the problem smaller by, yeah, right there. Yeah, so essentially I'm gonna look at my left and my right subtree separately. How that happens, whether that's a null or whatever, I mean, that's sort of an implementation detail, but you're right on. I'm gonna look at my left subtree and my right subtree. Both of those subtrees are smaller than the tree rooted at me. So I'm going to look at the right and sub left and right subtree separately. So essentially I'm gonna say, okay, if I'm not a leaf node, if I have either a right or a left child, that means there's a right and left subtree rooted at those children. And I'm gonna say, well, I don't wanna print myself because that's not what the algorithm said to do, but there's probably some leaf nodes below me. In fact, there are definitely leaf nodes below me. If you're not a leaf, then your right or left subtree both contain leaf nodes if they exist, at least one, if not several, all right? For this particular problem, how are we combining the results? So when we did a count, we essentially counted our right trunk subtree, counted our left subtree, and added the results together. When we did a sum, which you guys are working on today, you're gonna do the sum of the left subtree plus the sum of the right subtree and add them together. What do I do here? Sort of a special case, yeah. I'm just printing stuff, so I don't really need to, when I get to my base case, I'm gonna print the value. So there's really nothing to do here in the combine the result step. I'm just gonna restart the algorithm again. 
Okay, so let's do this. We have our typical binary tree class. I have a function called print leaves that's sitting here waiting for, for us to work on it. So let's just go back to our strategy. Okay, so my base case is reached a leaf node. So I know I'm a leaf node if, well, okay, so sorry. The first thing we usually do is we're gonna restart this on the root of the tree. So I'm gonna use a helper function here. You see that this is a void function because the results are gonna be printed as we go. We don't need to return anything here. So I'm gonna start my algorithm on the root of the tree. I'm gonna write my private helper function. All right, so now I've got my base case, if current.left is equal to null and current.right is equal to null. What do I do? So this means I'm a leaf. Don't a left subtree, don't a right subtree. So I just print the value. Yeah. One just tiny little clarification here, because this, this came up a couple times on a few uh, quizzes or exams. I just want to make sure you guys understand this. Um, System not out to Printland can print any object. You don't have to call toString. You can pass in anything. If it's an object, it'll call to string and print the result. If it's a primitive type, it'll print the result directly. But you know, somebody said, people were saying, well, I, I didn't think you could print an object directly. You can't. Yeah, this works fine. All right. So if I'm in a base case, I've got no work to do. Otherwise, I need to restart my algorithm on my right subtree and my left subtree. How am I going to do that? How do I restart this process on the right subtree? Someone just explain how to do that. That's a good, that'll be a good starting point. Uh, I can tell there was a weekend that happened. It was cold. I didn't expect you guys to get, forget that much over the weekend when it was cold. You guys were all inside, yeah. Yeah, so what I really want to do is I want to restart my print leaves function on my right child and then on my left child. So I can call print leaves current dot left. And I can call print leaves current dot right. What's the problem with this? This is going to run into a, a, a bug if I try to run it right now, David. Yeah, so I know that they're not both null because if they're both null, and actually here, I should stop here. That's important. So if they're both null, I've already printed myself and returned. But it's still possible that one is null. So right could be null or left could be null. They can't be both null because otherwise I'd hit the base case. But it's still possible that one of them is null. So there's two ways to fix this. So one way is to make sure that if my, I'm only restarting the algorithm on my left subtree if I have a left subtree. So I can say current left not equal to null, then restart on my left subtree. Oops. No, that's. And then if current.right is not equal to null, restart on my right subtree. So that will work. Okay. Let's see if this works. Okay. It seems to work. Let me add some more nodes here. All right. So you notice that one is never printed. One can't be a leaf in this tree because it's the root and there are several other nodes. If one was, actually let's try it. Let's try it on a, on a tree with one node. Make sure that one is printed, good. As soon as I add another node, now two is a leaf. If I add another node, now two and three are leaves, one is not a leaf. If I add more nodes, which ones are leaves depends on where they end up in the tree, and that depends on my randomized tree creation algorithm. But this is looking pretty good. So this is one way to solve the problem. There was another way that we discussed last time. What else can I do? It's a little bit cleaner, maybe. So here, I'm solving this problem by making sure that I never start print leaves on a null reference. Because if I do, if I call print leaves with the node that's null, I can do that. But then when I try to access its left child to figure out whether or not it's a leaf, I'm going to have a null pointer exception. Okay, so there's another way to fix this. 
Somebody who hasn't spoken up yet. I think people know the answer to this. Yeah. Yeah, so I can either, I can do this here. I can say if current is equal to null, just return, at which point I can get rid of these checks in here. All right. So this is also going to work. Great. Questions about this? Before we go on. Yeah. Excuse me? Yes, yes. Somebody's noticed. We're doing so. Indeed. A function, you know, this is one of the things that, that, that people find hard to understand when they start learning about recursion. We've created a method for solving the problem. Right? As soon as the problem gets small enough to solve, Right? So either I've walked off the end of the tree, which I put in here because it makes the rest of the code a little bit cleaner, or when I get to a leaf node, I stop. But otherwise, I call myself. This is one of the uh, hallmarks of a recursive implementation, is a function that calls itself. I can do this as long as I make sure that at some point I'm going to stop calling myself. Right? So for example, Let's try this. So what if I made a little mistake here, and instead of calling print leaves on current.left, I call it on myself. So what's happening now? So I call, you know, I, I call the wrapper function, which calls print leaves on the root. Print leaf says, is the, root, is the reference null? No. Is it a leaf node? No. And it restarts it on the root. So this is one of the tricks about recursive algorithms. You have to make the problem smaller. I haven't made the problem smaller. I started out with the root of the tree, a tree that has some number of nodes, and I'm restarting my algorithm on that same tree. And this will happen over and over and over again until you'll, you, you see what's something called a stack overflow error, meaning the computer has run out of memory and can't finish running this. And there's no way for it to finish running it because it's never going to stop. So one of our principles behind designing good recursive algorithms is we have to get to a base case. You have to be able to convince yourself that at some point, your recursive algorithm is going to stop calling itself again. And if you don't make the problem any smaller, then it's very hard for that to happen. So here, I'm making the problem smaller because I'm looking at my left subtree and my right subtree. By definition, again, at any node in the tree, and this is really important to think about with trees, my left subtree and my right subtree are both smaller. They have to be. They don't, they don't contain me. Even if I only have a right subtree, that right subtree is smaller by one node. If I have both a right and a left subtree, depending on the mix of nodes in both trees, both those trees could be substantially smaller, about half the size. Is there a question over here? OK, good. Good, David. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I, I, it's a good question. So the question is, what's the base case here? I would consider all of this to be a base case. A base case is a place where your recursive implementation is not restarting itself. So down here, these are my recursive steps. Restart myself on my left subtree, restart the algorithm on my right subtree. These are both smaller problems. And so because I'm making the problem smaller, I have some confidence that this function is going to eventually complete. All of these cases up here are essentially base cases. Right? They're cases where the algorithm does not continue to run, it stops and returns. So if you think about it, um, let's see here. Actually, this will be kind of fun. Let's, let's, let's do this. Here's what, let's, let's have a little fun with this. You guys can see how this is working. OK, so I'm going to create a um, variable here. I'm going to call this active, active prints. I'm going to initialize it to 0. All right? So every time I enter print leaves, there is a copy of, there's a print leaves function that's running. I'm going to increment that. And every time I leave, I'm going to decrement it. And I'm going to print it out at the top. So let's print off at the top uh, active prints. 
and then we're going to say active prints plus plus. Now, whenever I leave, I need to reduce the number of active prints. All right, so whenever this function returns, there's no longer an active print function running. All right, so let's think about what's going to happen when, let's run this on a small tree. Okay, so what's going to happen here? Let's, let's talk through and reason about what we think we're going to see. So the first time I'm when I'm at the root, I'm the first copy of print leaves that's running. So active print should be zero. Then I increment it. Then in this small tree that I set up, I know that the root node is going to have two children, one right child and one left child. So it's not a leaf. It can't be a leaf. It could only be a leaf if there was one node in the tree. So I know I'm not going to go through that statement on line 52 because the root's not null. And I also know I'm not going to go through the base case that starts on line 56 because I have two children. So I'm going to call print leaves on my left child. And then what happens is the first copy of print leaves is going to wait for that copy to finish. So it's going to jump up and it's going to re-enter print leaves, but now it's running on that smaller subtree. This will either be node 2 or node 3. I think, I can't remember which, do we add to the left first or to the right first? So it looks like we add to the right first. So 2 is going to be my right child and 3 is going to be my left child. So I'm going to restart the algorithm um, on the node with number 3. It's going to go through, and now active prints is 1 because there's an active copy of print leaves that's now waiting for this second copy to finish. So I'm going to increment it. Now I'm a leaf node. So I'm going to enter the base case on line 56, and I'm going to print my value, and I'm going to reduce the number of active prints. But so, so now we go up to the copy of print leaves that was running on the root, and it's called a print leaves current dot left is now finished. So it goes and restarts the algorithm on its right channel. So now I enter print leaves again. Now the count goes back to two. There's the print leaves that's running on node three, I think, and then there's the print leaves that's waiting on node one for that one to finish. So after this one finishes, that's also a leaf node. Print leaves goes back to one, and then I'm going to exit. So let's see what happens here. And I gotta put in a better print statement. There we go. Yeah, so when I start off at zero, when I get to the left child, there's one copy of print leaves waiting for me to finish. And when I get to the right child, there's still that one copy of print leaves waiting for me to finish, and then it exits. If I add more nodes to this tree, let's add some additional, you know, it really depends on where those nodes are placed, but you can see at some point, there are three copies of the print leaves function that are running. One started the second one that started the third one. The second one is waiting for the third one to finish, so it can figure it, it's done printing leaves in its part of the tree. And then the first one is waiting for the second one to finish, because then it's going to be done printing leaves in the entire tree. So my theory here, not everybody agrees with me about this, is that I don't think it's super helpful to think about this stuff when you're getting started with recursion. I would encourage you to focus on applying the design principles that we've talked about when you, when you think about these algorithms. This is what's happening behind the scenes. But, again, I would encourage you to think about those principles that we've discussed. Making the problem smaller, identifying a base case, and figuring out how to combine results from, from multiple steps. Questions about this before we go on? You guys will learn more about how recursion is actually implemented in later classes. For now, I want to teach you how to think about how to solve problems for Chris. All right, so, and, and, and here's, you know, here's what happens, right? So let's say I go back and I have this bug. Now this isn't gonna print anything because it's gonna crash first. But if it did, if this was printing, what you would see is print leaves active zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and it would just keep going and going and going and going and going. Because every time I call print leaves, I'm starting another copy of print leaves, and I'm waiting for that one to finish, and I'm starting another one waiting for one to finish. So if that goes on forever, each time I call print leaves, there's some amount of computer memory that I have to devote to performing that calculation. At some point, your computer runs out of memory, and this is the error that you get. 
Okay. okay. Questions about this? The mysteries of recursion. Dave. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a void function, so I don't have to specify a return. Yeah, good question. So the question was, why don't I need to return at the bottom? It's a void function. I might put one in there. I think it's a little cleaner, but you don't need it. Okay. So, I have an announcement to make. I'm pretty excited about this. This is something we've talked about in this class for a long time, and this is a new feature that we're rolling out today that I think is actually gonna really make a really positive impact on the class going forward for the next month. Starting today, you're not only gonna get credit for writing correct code to solve our homework problems. One of the criticisms of classes like this is that we rarely get to help you write good quality code. Auto graders can ensure that your code is correct, but we don't know what sort of gobbledygook that you've cobbled together to solve the problem. All right, I've seen some of those submissions, and I applaud you for eventually getting to the answer. But if you write that on a board in a coding interview, or if you write that into a shared document during your Facebook interview, you will not get a job. And at that point, it's gonna be very obvious to whoever's talking to you that no one has really been looking at your code. Now, we don't have enough staff to do that, at least not with the technologies we have, although we're thinking hard about how to solve that problem in the future. But what we can do is we can apply some standard code quality metrics to your submissions. And so starting today, you are gonna get one point out of 10 on the homework problems. So 10%, the tiny little amount, for not just writing a correct solution, but writing a solution that we deem to be perfect. Now that's a strong word, I know. I'm using it because I'm trying to incentivize you. Um, obviously we can't tell if your solution is perfect. You'd have to show it to me or to one of the core staff before we'd be really willing to say that. It's possible you've used terrible variable names. It's possible that you know, you've done other weird or unnecessary things that we can't detect. But there are some problems with your correct code that we can detect and that we are gonna start to take points off for. One point, all right? Don't freak out about this. It's not gonna have a huge impact on your grade. It is gonna have a major impact for those of you that choose to pursue this point on the quality of the code that you write for this class. And again, I'm super excited about this. We've talked about this for a while. This is the right point in the semester to do it. You guys are starting to write some more complicated things. I think this is gonna really help. So I'm gonna walk you through the two things that we are going to identify about your submissions that will result in it be de being deemed non-perfect, okay? There are two things that we, can, that we can see. The first is something called dead code. What is dead code? Dead code is code that when we tested your program, that code was never run. Now to me, this is a very easy case to make. If your program, if your submission contains code that was never executed during testing, by definition it's not perfect. Because I can get rid of that and it will still pass. Okay, so that's the first thing, dead code. The dead code message is gonna be helpful. It's gonna tell you what line your submission has dead code in it, and then you can think about how to fix it. It's usually pretty easy, just get rid of the dead code, right? But again, dead code is usually the result of some sort of leftover partial solution that you got to, and then you ended up solving the problem. You didn't think, go back and think through, you know, do I need these other parts, right? So that's the first thing. And again, I feel strongly about dead code, right? This is not something that we're gonna argue about. If your submission contains dead code, it's, it's not perfect. Okay, might be correct, not perfect. Second thing is complexity, okay? And this one is a little trickier. We're gonna walk through an example of this. But if your solution is, so what we're doing now is we have a solution that we've written for all the homework problems. Obviously, we've had that all along. But we're computing a metric about our solution that determines how many different ways a program can run through a particular function or your entire uh, class. If your code contains lots and lots and lots of unnecessary code paths, we're also gonna deem it to be not perfect. So those are two things that we're measuring. And that's in comparison with the solution. So we have a solution that we wrote. The solution is something that we think is perfect. And so we've calculated the complexity of the solution. This is something that's known as cyclomatic complexity. This is not a metric that we made up. If your solution is way too complex, or even just actually a little bit more complex than our solution, we're gonna deem it to be not perfect. 
All right, so let's look at some examples of these. All right, dead code. There is dead code on this slide. Who can identify it? This solution, this is correct, by the way. What I'm showing you here, these are two correct solutions to the size function you guys worked on over the weekend. Again, these are both correct. They're not perfect. Dead code, yeah. Yeah, what's going on down here? This is dead code. Why? Because I've already checked whether current is null, and I've already returned if it is. So this whole statement is actually unnecessary, right? But this line down here will never be executed. If current was null, the function's already returned, so there's no way for it to enter that branch of the else state, okay? Dead code. If you submit things with dead code, you won't get that one point for being perfect. Again, we're gonna help you with this. The output of this message is gonna help you identify where the dead code is. So it would say essentially, you know, the statement on line 12 is never executed. You'd be like, oh, right, okay, this is dumb. I don't need this else statement. And if I don't need the else statement, I don't need the if statement either. Because I know once I get to that point that current is not null. Okay. What about this one? So here's an example of a high complexity solution. Again, this is not wrong. This is correct. But it's too complicated. Someone explain to me what changes you would make to fix this. What's wrong with it? Yeah. Yeah, so I've, I've got this nice case up here. So I know that if this, again, this is size. So I know, if I know if I get to a null node that I've walked off the bottom of the tree and I should return zero, there's no tree here. But now I've got all of these, you know, statements here, right? where I say if left is null, then I use my right subtree. If right is null, use the left subtree, otherwise use both. I can replace all of this code with this just one statement, okay? Now, how do we measure complexity? That's interesting. So it's the number of different ways that control can flow through your program. So here's how this works. So I enter the program, there's one path here that I can hit if current is null. So I start with one just because I'm inside the program, and now I have two different paths, okay? Every one of these branches of the if statement contains a new way for the function to execute. So I've got two, three, four, five. There are five different ways that execution can proceed through this function. Now, this, this contains no dead code because there are cases where you're not going to have a left child, and there's cases where you're not going to have a right child. So there's no dead code in this solution. But it had, there's five paths through it, whereas the solution only has two. Right? In the solution, I get rid of this entire FL statement and just replace it with this one line, meaning that there's one, two, that's it. Okay, so these are the two things that we're going to start measuring about your programs. Now, again, we will, we will be happy to help you. The course staff's excited about this. They wanted to do this for a while. I think from the perspective of helping you guys writing tighter, cleaner, um, you know, code that is going to be more impressive to others. Now, again, perfect is a strong word. Uh, I can't tell if you're using awful variable names, right? That's one of the big things that would probably bother me if I looked at a lot of your code, but, um, but these are things that we can test in an automated fashion. All right, any questions about this. I do not think we're going to use this on the quizzes or on the exam, but maybe. I don't know. I'll think about it. Definitely on the homework for the remainder of the month, right? One point, not going to have a huge impact on your grade, but there if you want it. And again, like, we will help with this. Now, the, the course staff might be a little, you know, less helpful with this because they're going to push back and try to get you to think about it. You've already solved the problem, right? You have a correct solution. But we care about you as programmers, and we want you to write great code, code that will impress people, code that you will be happy with, code that doesn't contain these sorts of problems. Okay, any questions about this before we go on? I am happy to discuss this on the forum. 
Um, we started with this today. There may be some bugs in the system, fingers crossed. We've done a little bit of testing, uh, but if you find problems this week, please let us know. But all the problems this week are already set up to do this. So this will be your chance to get started. All right, awesome. Let's do another problem. Let's talk about looking for a certain item in a tree. So this is called tree search. How can we tell? So I've got a tree, that, that tree contains data, it's structuring data, and I want to find an element. How do I know whether or not the tree contains a particular value? This is a little bit more complicated than the last one, which is going to be fun. So how do we do this? Start thinking about a way to break up this problem. So what's the base case? When do we stop? Now, this is more interesting than the ones we've done before. It's kind of interesting. I'm searching for a value. When is my, when do I stop? Yeah. Yeah, so there's, there's two parts to this base case. If I find the value, I can stop immediately, right? I don't care if that node has children, I'm done. I found the value. I don't need to look through the rest of the tree. So imagine a tree where the root node contains the value that I'm looking for. I don't need to search the rest of the tree, I'm done. Return true. Don't do more work than you need to. I'm not asking you to count the number of values. All I care about is this one property of this tree. Does it contain the value? If one of the root's children has the value, I stop there immediately. So as soon as I find the value, I can stop, right? So this is actually wrong, right? Um, I also have to stop if I walk off the end of the tree, right? So I'm talking about the good cases where I find the value, but at some point, I'm gonna get to a leaf node or I'm gonna get to null because I've allowed myself to walk off the edge of the tree, and at that point, I should also stop, right? Okay, so my base case, if I find the value, I'm finished. Otherwise, if I can't search anymore, if I'm out of nodes to look at, then I can also stop. How do I make the problem smaller? Again, canonical approach on trees. Yeah. Look in one side and then the other side, exactly. Subtrees, subtrees, subtrees. Every, well, every subtree of a tree is a tree. So I say, if I don't contain the value, I'll look in my right subtree, and then I'll look in my left subtree. Both of those trees are smaller, and so I've reduced the number of nodes I need to look through. Yeah. We'll get, yeah, sorry, keep going. Right, so if I, if I find a, if I get to a leaf, I know that that part of the tree doesn't contain the node, right, as long as the value isn't the same, right? But I've still got other copies of this that are running and looking through other things. Yeah, it's a great question. It's one of those things that's like hard to wrap your mind around with recursion, right, but it will work, okay. Consider right and left subtree separately. I look at my right, I look at my left. If I don't have the value, and neither my right or my left subtree contain the value, then the value doesn't exist in that part of the tree. If that part of the tree is the tree that I'm started with, if I'm the root, then the value doesn't exist in the entire tree. How do I combine the results? Last step here, so three steps to my recursive algorithm. Base case. Combining results and breaking things into smaller pieces. So how do I combine results together? You know, when, I, when I've done sizes and sums, I've added stuff. Last time we didn't need to do this because I was printing. What do I do here? Yeah. Well, but like what if my left subtree doesn't contain the value and my right subtree contains the value, what should I return? Yeah, yeah, so I'm, I'm essentially I'm doing a logical or. If either my right subtree or my left subtree contains the value, I'm done, all right? So I return true if either the right subtree or the left subtree contains the value. If I contain the value, I didn't even search those subtrees, right, because I didn't need to. Okay, let's do it. So standard binary tree setup, I have a search um, function. Now here's our first example of a recursive algorithm that takes an argument. It takes the value to look for, right? 
just kind of interesting. I don't know, sorry, I don't know why the indentation is messed up here. I'm going to fix that. So as usual, I'm going to restart my algorithm on a, a private uh, version of this function that allows me to start at the root, right? So I can call it recursively. So I have a, here's the one that's actually going to do the work. So I'm going to take the node, the current root of the tree, and the value to look for. All right, so I'm going to use my usual base case here of null, which allows me to simplify some of the other things. So if I've walked off the end of the tree, it doesn't contain the value. The tree has zero nodes in it. Okay, so I return false. Otherwise, if current dot value dot equals, I've got objects in here, so I need to use dot equals. If it equals the value, yeah. What do I do here? This is one of my base cases. So I contain the value. Therefore, what do I return? True, yeah. The tree rooted at me contains the value right here. All right. I return true. All right, so I've got my base cases done. Now, how do I search through the rest of the tree? Oh, it's so elegant. You guys are going to love it. How do I do this? So at this point, I know that I don't contain the value, but I don't know about the rest of the nodes. Yeah. I can do that. So essentially, I'm going to do search current.left value. I have to pass it the value, right? And I'm going to do, uh, here's what I want to do. I essentially want to call search current.write value. How do I combine these together? David. Bingo, look at that. That's the thing about recursion. You gotta give it credit. Like, that is nice, right? That's it. I hope, hope it works. Let's try it. All right, okay, so that's true. Let's look for something that's not in the tree, false. Let's look for something else that's not in the tree, false. Let's make the tree a bit bigger. Okay, now that should be true. Let's try a single node tree and make sure that we didn't mess that up. Um, Let's try something that's not an integer. That's always going to be false. Let's try one. This should be true. That's it. So people, you know, people that have done this for a while, we'll talk about recursive algorithms being elegant, right? And, and they are. Look at that. There's literally one line of code that's doing the work here, right? That line at the end, where essentially I'm saying, I don't contain the value. Therefore, I'm going to restart the search on my left subtree and restart the search on my right subtree. Here's the other thing that's cool about this. Let's say that the, I start this on the root, and the left subtree of the root contains the value that I'm looking for. What will happen at that point? So I started on the root. The root didn't contain the value, but this returned true. What nice feature of Java kicks in now? Yeah. Yeah, I'm not even going to look at my right subtree. I'm done. Right? So if this function returns true, so if I start at the root and the left subtree of the root contains the value, this doesn't even get executed. I won't even bother with the right subtree. So that's a nice feature of, of Java that kicks in here. If the left subtree doesn't contain the value, then I've got to go and look in the right subtree as well. Right? So then that has to execute. But, but this applies at every level of the tree, too. So the number of nodes that I'm actually going to visit if the node is in the tree, typically tends to be much smaller than the tree itself. So actually, let's do this again. Let's say I'm going to create a variable here. When I start my search, I'm going to say nodes visited is equal to 0. And then I'm going to say boolean result is equal to search. And I'm going to print nodes visited. And then I'm going to return the result. So I've just essentially stuck this in here. Um, and every time I rerun this on an actual node, I'm not going to count the nulls, I'm going to say nodes visited plus plus. All right. 
So there I visited one node. How many nodes am I gonna visit here? I'm looking for one in a tree rooted with the value of one. One, it's pretty awesome. What about if I look for eight? Let's see how many, three. Sometimes this number might be a little smaller. Yeah, it depends on how the tree is created. Right? We're randomizing our tree creation, and so the place where eight is is gonna move around. But this tree has five nodes. And so even now, my search function is a little bit faster, assuming I'm looking for something that's in the tree. Let's look for something that's not in the tree. Okay, five. Let's look for not in tree. Five. So obviously, if I wanna show that there's something that's not in the tree, I have to go through every single item, one by one. But if I find it, I can stop. Questions about this? You guys have a chance to do this on one of the homework problems or something similar, I think. All right, I think I'm gonna do this example and stop right here. So I can potentially make this search a little bit more efficient. Anyone have an idea about how to do this? So remember, when we started talking about trees, we talked about the fact that trees get used for lots of stuff. There are so many different sub-varieties of trees in computer science designed for different purposes. So how could I change the design of this tree to help me find things? Yeah. Yeah, so the, the, the response was, can I change the order of how I arrange things? Okay, that's, that's really interesting. Let me show you something here. My search function, it's pretty nice, but if I swap these and look in the right subtree first and the left subtree, it doesn't matter. It's still going to work. But here's the problem. I don't know whether or not the value's in my right subtree or my left subtree. The value could be anywhere in this tree because there's no rule about where values go. So the question is, can I develop a rule about where I put things in the tree that then allows me to search it more efficiently? So for example, if I, I could tell whether or not the value should be in my right subtree or should be in my left subtree, then I wouldn't have to search both. I could just say, if the value should be in my right subtree, look in my right subtree. Otherwise, if the value should be in my left subtree, look in my left subtree, right? So I can make the, this is already making the problem smaller, but in the worst case, it's only making the problem smaller by one node. But if I know which subtree to look in, then I can make the problem about half as small each time, assuming that the remaining nodes are evenly distributed between the trees. The way to do this is a variant of a tree. It's a variant of a binary tree. It's something called a binary search tree. So I put the code up here for you to look at. Um, it's very similar to our tree, to the trees we've already been working with, except there are some important changes here. What do you guys notice? You start looking at this. What's different about this tree from the trees that we've been working with so far? So what's different about a binary search tree from a binary tree? It's still, every node still has two children. Let's look at the node class, okay? Every node still has a right and a left child. There's something different about a node though. What's different about this? Anybody with an eagle eye spot this? Yeah. Yeah, I'm not storing an object anymore, and now I'm storing a reference to something that implements the comparable interface in Java. Hmm, okay, so that's a clue. You'll notice that my constructor now takes an array of objects that are comparable to each other. So now I can't store any object in this tree. I can only store objects where there's an uh, there's a idea of ordering. Where am I using that? So before when I was creating trees to make interesting trees, I was randomly adding nodes to them at random spots. But what am I doing now? Let's look at our add function. So the add function, if there's no root, I add the node at the root. But before what I did is I essentially had a randomized choice here. I essentially randomly said, 
if I don't have a right subtree and I don't have a left, sorry, if I don't have a right child and I don't have a left child, pick one of my subtrees at random and add the node there. What am I doing now? It's a little bit different. I'm gonna describe how this add algorithm is working. I'm still make, I still have to make a choice here, right? So I still have to make a choice about where to put the node in the tree. But how am I making that choice? Before I would choose it random. Now what am I doing? I'm comparing it to myself. So someone said before, if I add some structure to the tree, maybe I can use that to search it more effectively. So now there's a rule about these trees. The rule is, when I add a node, if the node is bigger than the current node, or depending on it, it could be bigger or smaller, it doesn't matter. This is just a convention. But depending on if the node is bigger than the current node, then it has to go to the right, right? So here I'm saying, if I don't have a right child, add it as my right child, otherwise add it to my right subtree somewhere. So if the node's bigger than me, it goes to the right. Otherwise, if it's either equal to me or smaller, it goes to the left. Okay, so I'm not adding randomly anymore, I'm adding based on the value of the node. So again, and, and there's a, this is a recursive add algorithm. The algorithm says, if there's room at this level of the tree, so essentially if the value I'm adding is bigger to the current value and it doesn't have a right child, add it as the right child. Otherwise, restart the algorithm on that subtree. So then it's still gonna end up to my right. If it's equal or smaller than me, if I don't have a left child, add it as my left child. Otherwise, restart the algorithm on the left subtree. But it's still gonna end up to my left. So I've created a rule about where things go in the tree. And this rule is going to allow me to structure my search algorithm more effectively. And that is something that you guys will have a chance to do on one of the homework problems. All right, I wanna finish up here and this is sort of where we'll pick up um, on Wednesday. We, talked, we had some new things to talk about today, so this is okay. Before, we're, when we come back on Wednesday, we're gonna talk a little bit about recursion on data structures that are not trees. We've been talking about recursion on trees because it's a really natural fit for the tree data structure. But remember, trees as a data structure had this recursive property, which is every subtree of a tree is itself a tree. But there are other things that I can stick in here. There are other data structures we've talked about that also have this recursive property where I can break them into smaller pieces where the pieces themselves are still an instance of that thing. What's one of those? Yeah. Okay, a graph, yeah, you guys are, yeah, that's true, you guys are working on, on these with uh, MP4, so that's one example. What about ones we've talked about in class? Yeah. An array. If I take an array and divide it into two parts, values before an index and after an index, I've got two smaller arrays. What's another similar data structure that we've talked about that also has this problem? Yeah, a list. If I take a list and I create, you know, the first n elements and then the ones after that, I have two smaller lists. So on Wednesday, we'll talk a little bit about uh, a recursive algorithm that we could run on a non-tree data structure. All right, so uh, we had a lot of extra stuff today, which is totally okay. Um, We'll also talk about the fair on Wednesday. So just a couple of announcements today. MP4 is out. Um, it's due two weeks from today. Please take advantage of our Monday office hours. We have heavy office hours on Mondays frequently because we have deadlines. There is no deadline today. There's two weeks until the deadline and a week until the early deadline, but there's still a lot of CAs there. Please come and get help on MP4. This is a hard MP, all right? Start it now and you'll do well. I will see you guys on Wednesday.